Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And welcome to uh, an ongoing series that we have where we're reaching out and, and sharing some of our outreach programs in the community. And uh, uh, this week we bring us to, uh, to a special one that we get a lot of calls about uh, uh, presenting in the community. And that is our one on accidents and disasters that have uh, that have affected the city of Mississauga. Sorry, button issues here. Uh, Mississauga's ABCDs, accidents, blazes, calamities, and disasters. And there are a number of, uh, uh, many things like this affect any community, uh, regardless of, uh, of time. And uh, Mississauga really is no different, but we have stories that are our own and, and challenges that, that, uh, that we face, some on a much broader scale and we are a part of, some specific to this place that we call home today. And so, this presentation is going to explore uh, the accidents, blazes, calamities, and disasters that have visited Mississauga historically, uh, Mississauga's ABCDs. Uh, the first uh, story in the in the accident realm is that of an Eastern Flyer a train accident in 1916. It's one of the the uh, the, the oddities, I guess, of, of local history when we talk. Uh, someone will ask about the train accident, and invariably they're referring to something that happened in 1979. But as a historian's point of humor, sometimes I ask them which one. Um, there, there, there have been a few in time. We'll talk about them individually here. But uh, the, um, uh, the the train, uh, the Eastern Flyer accident in Port Credit, uh, uh, took place on March twenty third of nineteen sixteen in the evening. It was it was dark, uh, and this this uh, contributed to the the accident, the, the lack of light. Uh, at ten fifteen p.m., the Eastern Flyer uh, passenger train, which was en route from Toronto to Montreal. On its way in, in uh, by Toronto and across uh, across the uh, the lakeshore in towards Montreal, um, it crashed into a stopped coal and freight train uh, two kilometers just outside of Port Credit. Um, the Eastern Flyer was a lightly built high speed passenger train at the time, and uh, plowing into the back end of a stopped uh, freight train uh, loaded with coal. Um, it wasn't a surprise of who got the worst of the accident, and that was the uh, the absolute decimation of the Eastern Flyer. Um, at the time of the collision, the Eastern Flyer was uh, was estimated to be tra traveling around 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, the engineer um, in the in the locomotive of the Eastern Flyer, the engineer Hovey, Harry Overend, and the fireman W. A. Anderson, uh, who was in the freight train, were killed. Uh, as a result of the uh, of the accident, and so you had this uh, this challenge of a of a stopped freight train uh, and uh, a high speed passenger train making contact on the rails two kilometers outside of Port Credit. Um, part of the challenge was um, uh, an underestimation of the length of the uh, of the freight train. It had actually done its job according to the signal. It was to pull off the main line and allow the higher speed uh, passenger train to overtake it. Uh, they were sharing the, the, the one line. The challenge was when the train pulled off the tracks, it did not get all the way off the tracks. And in the dark light, uh, or the, the lack of light in the darkness of, uh, of the evening, uh, 10 p.m., 10, 15 p.m. on March 23rd, um, the uh, headlight uh, did not illuminate far enough in advance for the Eastern Flyer to really affect its brakes. Um, and so with very little warning, uh, seeing the, uh, the train stopped on the tracks ahead of it, um, engineer Ho Harry Overin applied the brakes to the Eastern Flyer without uh, any success. Very few pictures. This is one that uh, was shared, uh, is from the, uh, the uh, Toronto Daily Star, um, and now the Toronto Star. But uh, highlight, uh, showing the, the cleanup afterwards of the uh, the uh, of the cars from the uh, from the Eastern Flyer, so it was a devastating accident uh, at the time. Um, the coroner's inquest was held by Dr. Sutton uh, out of Cooksville, and um, the uh, they determined that the, the really the cause of it was the uh, the station signal in Port Credit mistook the freight train for the flyer and had the freight train. Uh, stop on the siding on which uh, it was too long uh, to for the siding to accommodate it. Um, three of the rear cars of the freight train and the caboose remained on the main line and it was the caboose and the rear cars that the, the Eastern Flyer struck. Um, the engineer overend of the flyer was praised as a hero. Um, he did not bail from the engine. 
he was applying the brakes with all that is all his might and um, uh, lost his life in the collision when his body was found in the wreckage of the locomotive of the eastern flyer his hand was still grasping the brakes at least according to the newspapers and so harry overin was praised as a hero for significantly slowing down the train to avoid any further loss of life. Um, there were approximately, uh, one report says 16 passengers, another report says 67 passengers. So I'm not really sure if it's 16 or 67 um, were injured, um, but the only loss of life on the Eastern Flyer was indeed uh, Harry Overin, uh, the engineer. Uh, and of course the uh, the, uh, the fireman from the, uh, the coal train, the freight train, also lost his life uh, in the accident. Presumably he was in the caboose at the time uh, of the accident. Uh, the newspapers don't go into a great deal, a uh, great uh, amount of detail regarding his fate. Um, so the two casualties uh, of the Eastern Flyer accident in March of 1916. And there we go to the Port Credit train derailment of 1965. And again, this is a uh, uh, when we talk train derailments, although we have a, certainly a bigger, uh, a big one that we'll get to shortly, uh, 1965 has almost become obscured at it, but the, as the picture shows, it was not something uh, small uh, that took place. That is uh, damaged cars uh, looming over the bridge at here in, at the here in Ontario Street Bridge over the, uh, where the railway tracks cross, and that is a, 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 a freight car uh, toppled on the roadway below. Um, this was uh, what, what had happened was November 11th of 1965 at 1.30 in the morning, a, westbound, a westbound CPR freight train passed through an open switch um, and crashed at full speed into the rear of a slower moving CN freight train right on the uh, here on Terra Street overpass. Um, freight cars crashed over the bridge, tangled wreckage in a mess uh, quite, uh, quite below. Uh, that there wasn't more loss of life was uh, was was quite significant, probably aided by the fact that it was one thirty in the morning and the transportation was uh, at, uh, to say the very least, minimum on the on here on Terra Street uh, where the accident, uh, where uh, underneath the railway pass for, on here on Terra Street where the accident occurred. Um, there were two casualties: uh, CPR engineer uh, Joseph Cassidy and CN conductor Jack O'Connell were killed in the accident. Uh, the inquest found that the rail switch had malfunctioned, allowing the slow moving CN train to travel the main line instead of being shunted off to the siding. Um, that unfortunately allowed a slower moving train in the path of a faster moving one, which could not stop uh, in time to avoid the, avoid the collision. Um, the rail line itself was closed for several days and uh, it was uh, a couple of weeks before the bridge was repaired and the tracks were up and running again. Um, but again, our first train derailment, um, uh, much smaller scale than 1979, but unfortunately with a loss of life, uh, CPR engineer Joseph Cassidy and CN conductor Jack O'Connell again lost their lives in the Port Credit train derailment of 1965. From there, we'll go to the Malton gas explosion. Um, uh, taking place October 25th of 1969, uh, really the first uh, major emergency faced by the young town of Mississauga. Uh, Mississauga had just, uh, the township of Toronto had become the town of Mississauga in 1968. So a year later in 1969, um, a gas line uh, under the intersection or roughly under the intersection of Derry and Airport Road erupted. Uh, nine stores, several houses, 46 cars and trucks all destroyed. Uh, 22 people injured and sadly one casualty, uh, Jean, per uh, Jean Perigo, uh, age 75, was killed when her house collapsed upon her. Um, because of the nature of the fire and the, the one, dis one uh, descriptor called it a roaring beast, um, the, uh, the ruptured gas line uh, was, it was quite some time before they were able to, uh, to turn the gas off um, and firefighters were unable to get close enough to the scene to really battle the fire itself until the gas itself was able to um, uh, to be uh, to be uh, diminished. Um, the initial uh, uh, objective for firefighters was to contain the fire from spreading, but uh, they had to wait until the gas line itself. And it was a gas main, uh, a dead end, uh, a trunk of off a gas main that had uh, its pressure valve had failed, and uh, it caused the rupture. Again, roughly under the intersection of what is the airport, Derry, and Airport Roads today in Malton.
there's a picture of it from uh, um, uh, looking from the, the north side, uh, looking uh, towards uh, looking southwards towards the uh, towards the fire itself. Just an enormous fire that's going on in the distance. And again, you can see just the buildings. Even the, even there's a, a closeness there of a person by a telephone pole looking at it, and you can just see how dwarfed they are by this roaring uh, inferno. The, uh, the fire itself lasted for about four and a half hours, absolutely intense heat. There are pictures of melted car, uh, car wheels and the steering wheels and the like, and just the absolute heat uh, that was generated from the fire was, was enormous. You can see in the picture here, those are uh, firefighters hiding beside, behind what looks to be a utility box as they try to get as close as they can to, uh, to, to try and battle the fire. A uh, coroner's inquest uh, due to the death of Jean Perigo was held in February of 1979. And it found that a wrong supply valve had been switched, uh, putting too much pressure on a dead end pipe, um, a pipe that was uh, intended to extend northward as uh, uh, Malton grew. Um, but uh, unless there was a, a wrong uh, fitting that was in place and uh, the pressure valve could not contain the pressure and finally released. Uh, it really destroyed Malton's historic four corners. So if you go to the intersection of Deary and Airport Roads today, it is completely rebuilt after the 1969 gas explosion. There's an aerial view of it. Um, and uh, you can just uh, make out kind of the uh, the ground zero, if you will, with all the burnt out buildings here. Oh. Um, that are evident in the uh, in the uh, photograph itself. So, absolutely astronomical um, uh, local effects are taking place here in uh, in the in the Malton community. Uh, from there, we go to another accident. This was the Air Canada Flight 621 of 1970. Um, uh, July 5th of 1970, an Air Canada Douglas DC-8. Uh, flying from uh, Montreal to Toronto uh, and eventually to Los Angeles. The, um, what was cited as a pilot error in deploying the spoilers to slow down the plane on landing at Pearson. The plane hit the runway hard, um, breaking off the number four engine. The pilots did not notice that the engine had, uh, had broken off and due to the hard impact, they regained altitude uh, for another go around. Uh, unfortunately, with the, with the broken engine, which the, the pilots were not aware of at the time, um, there was trailing fuel, and uh, uh, this uh, trail of fuel uh, ignited uh, as the plane uh, attacked, uh, uh, circled the airport for a second go around. Um, and you can see the uh, newspaper account there of the uh, the whole wing assembly in. Um, uh, in fire, and what had happened was the uh, uh, once they were airborne again, they realized that there's an engine problem with number four. They cut engine four. Unfortunately, the, uh, the the fuel cell ruptured and exploded, destroying part of the wing uh, of the aircraft, making it uh, unable to flight. And as they tried to power it to come around for a landing, uh, there is uh, they're, they're struggling to control the plane, and ultimately they do not. Uh, one of the last words on the. Uh, uh, flight recorder uh, was uh, the, um, the co-pilot to the pilot saying, sorry Pete. Um, and uh, unfortunately the, the airplane itself within a matter of seconds um, uh, from hitting the runway to regaining altitude to uh, ultimately crashing north of the airport was approximately 19 seconds and uh, um, absolutely uh, uh, devastation on the, on the, on the, uh, on the landscape. Um, the after uh, you know, two minutes after striking the runway, 19 seconds before impact, uh, uh, part of the right wing uh, exploded. Uh, second explosion destroyed engine number three. Uh, third explosion destroyed most of the right wing as the, the fuel ignited. Uh, the plane hit the ground at 220 knots. All 100 passengers and eight crew were killed. Um, a board of inquiry determined that pilot error was the uh, was the ultimate cause of the uh, the plane crash again, deploying the spoilers uh, too early on uh, on landing, um, uh, dropping the speed of the aircraft to the point where it had a hard impact on the tarmac uh, prior to attempting to regain altitude and to go around for a second flight, uh, a second landing attempt. 
Um, there's a, a close-up of the uh, crash site, which itself is in Brampton today, just over the just north of the southern border. And the crash site is remembered on the ground today with a, a park feature uh, commemorating the 100 passengers and eight crew who lost their lives in 1970 with the crash of Air Canada's BC-8. Um, staying with the aircraft as well, uh, Air Canada Flight 189 in 1978. Uh, this accident took place on June 26 of 1978, um, and a, a, the, the uh, problem actually was not with the air, aircraft being airborne, it was during takeoff with uh, the plane taxiing down the runway attempting to gain speed for takeoff, a, a, a tire burst. Uh, the pilot uh, attempted to apply the brakes to abort the uh, takeoff. At the time, the plane was about two-thirds down the runway traveling at 154 knots. The plane could not stop before the end of the runway. Um, it uh, went off the runway, skidded through a, a barrier, uh, down an embankment, and uh, ultimately ended up at the bottom of a ravine. Um, and uh, this is something that we'll, we'll play again in the story of the airport as well, but uh, there's, a, there's a picture of, uh, of the wreckage of the aircraft after it's come to a rest. Uh, so Flight 189, uh, the plane ultimately broke into three parts. Uh, two of the 107 passengers and crew were killed uh, just due to the, the jostling and the impact of the crash as it uh, came down the embankment. Um, a number of uh, causes were identified, including an insufficient overshoot zone at the end of the runway and, of course, the presence of the ravine itself did not help. Uh, there was no uh, kind of not a large enough space for error if, uh, if an abort uh, had, to, uh, had to overshoot the runway. And uh, this again uh, would not be rectified and came to be a focus again in 2005, that very same overshoot. Uh, but uh, again, uh, Air Canada Flight 189, uh, 1978, an attempted abort of a takeoff uh, ended up with a train, with a plane crashing down a ravine. Um, and two of 107 passengers and crew being killed in that, that accident. Mississauga train derailment of 1979, I've always already made a couple of references to it. Arguably our uh, uh, most significant chapter in the story of what is the city of Mississauga. Uh, the derailment itself took place on November 10th, 1979, 11.56 uh, p.m. Um, uh, CP train 54, um, having just crossed the um, Burnthorpe Road level crossing at the time, uh, car 23 lost uh, a, a axle and a wheel uh, crashing into a, into a residential backyard. But the train itself with, a uh, with one car having a damaged uh, and dangling undercarriage continued on down the railway tracks, uh, ultimately uh, derailing at the Navis Road level crossing and um, uh, car 23 uh, came off the tracks and the next 22 cars followed it, uh, ending, uh, ending up in a massive fireball of an explosion. Uh, we will do a, another presentation at a later date on, on this subject in itself. Um, but uh, needless to say, this was an enormous challenge for the emergency responders. The first major test of the Peel Emergency Response Plan. Um, to, uh, 11.58, the first police are on site, 12.01, CP rail is identified, 12.04, fire crews are, arrive on site, and they stay. The fire crews were on site for days. Uh, this is something that did not, uh, was not easily uh, quenched, if you will. Um, at 3.21 a.m., uh, in the midst of a burning wreckage, a chlorine car is identified, um, and very quickly, um, uh, evacuation orders are, are presented and, uh, and effective throughout the city, ultimately evacuating approximately 240,000 residents at the time, the largest peacetime evacuation in North American history. Um, there's a picture from miles away looking at the towering inferno that was uh, the one of the bloody explosions from the Mississauga train derailment. Um, mass evacuation, the city was closed until further notice, uh, as the newspaper headline said, uh, referred to by many as a Mississauga miracle because the, the, the massive uh, scale of the evacuation from a local perspective and absolutely no loss of life, and that is the miracle indeed. Um, it really put Mississauga on the international map. It started to, uh, people started to use the word of the city in, in headlines and, and uh, Parliament and beyond. Um, 
they even issued t-shirts afterwards and uh, so really probably the biggest singular chapter in this in the history and the story of, of mississauga something specific to mississauga that being the mississauga train derailment of november of 1979 and there's a picture of it looking northward on mavis road uh between uh, Dundas Street and Burnthorpe, Burnthorpe in the distance here. And you can see the absolute mess of the train derailment. And uh, like I said, we'll do another program on this uh, to a, a greater detail. Uh, Air France Flight 358 in 2005, um, uh, much similar to the one we talked about uh, just previously in 1978. Uh, this one took place on uh, August 2nd of 2005 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, from a Paris to Toronto uh, uh, route. Uh, it was an Airbus uh, 340 that overshot uh, runway 24 left. Um, and uh, it, the plane itself uh, overshot the runway, uh, crashed through a security fence, was unable to break in time, and crashed down a ravine um, uh, just adjacent to the Etobicoke Creek. Um, amazingly, a uh, miracle in itself, 297 passengers and 12 crew all survived, some with obviously bumps and bruises and, uh, and, uh, and injuries, but uh, it really was uh, almost a repeat of the 1979 crash right to the site itself, uh, overshot a runway and down the embankment. Uh, after the plane had, uh, had crashed and passengers evacuated, it did catch fire and uh, these striking images were caught by, uh, by passengers nearby or by travelers nearby on uh, Highway 401. Um, and you can see just the enormity of, of uh, the conflagration here of, of the aircraft uh, consumed in flames. Um, the, uh, there were 12 major injuries, no fatalities, highly visible from the 401. Uh, they cited poor weather and poor visibility, uh, including a wet tarmac. It was, uh, was stormy and rainy. Um, and there was also the pilots delayed in deploying the thrust reversers. So almost uh, the opposite uh, initial cause from the, the previous accident that uh, deployed uh, re uh, the, an earlier one that was the crash that deployed them too early. This one deployed too late, so it was unable to break in time. Thankfully, again, no loss of life. From there, we'll go into our blazes category and we'll look at some of the significant fires that swept through, uh, through our community. The Cooksville conflagration, as, uh, as we come to call it, uh, in 1852. Um, historically, many buildings were built of wood um, and fires were an ever-present threat. And we have countless examples of fires. We're only going to touch on a few of them in this presentation. Uh, but on May 26th of 1852, fire started in John Belcher's blacksmith shop in Ford, uh, Forge in Cooksville. Uh, he was on the north side of, uh, of Dundas Street, uh, uh, between Cook Street and uh, here, Ontario. Um, and uh, uh, all in all, by the time the fire was over, 35 uh, houses and businesses lost, 16 barns, four stables, and the old town hall, or Retrobites Hall as it was known, was also lost in the fire. And very little of the core of the village around the intersection of Dundas Street and here, Ontario survived. Um, the uh, one of the lone remaining uh, hallmarks that echo back to that time is a building that was built immediately after the fire, after the first general store was lost, a second general store was built, and that building survives today. That is the 1852 Copeland General Store, as it was known, now a Minimart uh, at the corner of Dundas Street, at the uh, south uh, east corner of Dundas Street in here, Ontario. You can still see the 1852 General Store a, um, built uh, out of the ashes of the Great Fire of 1852. Uh, the Dairy West Fire of 1867. Um, if Mississauga had something that was, uh, had a place that, to, within it that was uh, dreaming of bigger things, of growing, and Dairy West was certainly it. Um, when it came time to pl uh, plan for, to apply to be the county seat for Peel County uh, in the 1850s, there were several applicants, including Streetsville and Brampton, who ultimately got it, Malton and Derry West. And the question being, you know, what on earth did Derry West have anything to do with that conversation? It's certainly disappeared from our landscape today. Well, if it weren't for a fire in 1867, a very uh, scarcely covered fire in terms of the news, uh, we might well be living in the community of Derry West today rather than Mississauga. It's all a, a rose-colored glasses of history. We're never quite sure the way things might have worked. But Derry West certainly uh, was on the, on the, the uh, 
prime example of being primed to expand as a community. Unfortunately, with the uh, uh, being swept by fire in 1867, much of the, the, the crossroads village of Derry West was lost and very, very little was rebuilt. Uh, churches, hotels, um, uh, houses, a schoolhouse, etc. they were all lost in a fire. Uh, and the Dairy West itself was located around the intersection of Dairy Road and here in Tarot Street. Um, reportedly that two women died in uh, the, the loss of the Browns Hotel um, uh, during the fire as well. So Dairy West uh, struck by fire in 1867 and very, very little of it uh, remained uh, or was rebuilt after the fire itself. Uh, the Globe Hotel fire in Streetsville in 1876. Uh, the Globe Hotel in the historic picture here is the big picture, the big uh, hotel on the left of that picture. Uh, September 6th of 1876, a um, uh, fire started in the hayloft of, in the stables behind the Telegraph Hotel. Both the Globe and the Telegraph were were lost, as were several adjacent buildings. There was loss of life, including the son of the founder of Streetsville, Timothy Street Jr. Uh, lost his life in the fire, may have actually been the cause of the fire, but uh, he lost his life in the fire. Um, it, it was said that the fire could have been much worse and might have actually swept through the, the, uh, the village of Streetsville at the time, um, but uh, it started to rain and rain quite heavily and that uh, put an end to the fire. Um, alcohol, excessive drinking, and a careless match uh, were, were, to, were said to blame for the uh, setting the hay on fire. Um, again, with loss of life and a great deal of uh, property damage in uh, the downtown core of Streetsville in 1876. Also in Streetsville, um, uh, a few decades later, uh, June 29th of 1909, uh, fire broke out in the Graydon General Store in Streetsville, uh, referred to as the Graydon Fire. Um, it destroyed several buildings on, uh, on the west side of Queen Street in downtown Streetsville. And the loss of the, uh, the, uh, the Graydon store, but the adjacent Graydon house claimed four members of the Graydon family. And there's a picture of the Graydon house um, uh, being consumed by fire. The store has already been lost next door. Um, the Great Arendelle Fire, one of the, the fires that really um, uh, put its stamp on the, on the history of the community. Uh, May 6th of 1919, um, a carelessly dropped a match uh, into a kerosene bucket, accidental uh, as it was, uh, set the Barker General Store uh, ablaze. Um, there were strong winds coming out of the north, out of the valley. It flamed the, fi the, uh, the, the fire, causing it to spread um, both, um, both to the east and to the south. Um, and it, although many firefighters, uh, uh, including Cooksville and Port Credit firefighters came out to uh, try to fight the fire. It proved to be a most difficult and stubborn fire to uh, to try and uh, contain. By the time it was out, uh, the fire consumed 14 buildings in the middle of the village. Most of it was never rebuilt, and arguably the village never truly recovered um, from the from the fire itself. Um, one of the buildings, as you can see in the picture below, that survived was uh, a mill building built of stone, and that was the, uh, the the line the fire shall not cross. As the firefighters uh, fought it, they, they they used the stone of the building and watered down the roof to kind of create a block for the fire, and they were successful in having the fire halt at that building. Unfortunately, that building itself, Brown Cider Mill, uh, burned four years later itself, and so that building is also gone to this day. So most of Arendelle was lost in the um, in the fire uh, itself. Again, starting at the uh, the Barker uh, General Store and Post Office, um, and right next door to the uh, the Royal Exchange Hotel, a um, hundred year old building, uh, a famous hotel was also consumed and lost by the fire. And this picture here, this is at the intersection of what is essentially Dundas Street and Jarvis Street. Um, and uh, you can see just on the left is the brown uh, cider mill, which was uh, saved itself, losing to fire a few years later. And the White House on a hill across the other way is the the, the old Jarvis house, um, and that still stands to this day as a private residence. So just give yourself a bearing on kind of the uh, the, the, the epicenter of the fire itself. Uh, into Streetsville again, uh, the Streetsville Mill Fire of uh, 1929. 
Um, the, if you ever look at the Mississauga coat of arms, you'll find a mill wheel, a cog wheel on the coat of arms. And that reference is taken from the street school coat of arms, uh, which are also depicted a mill wheel. And it's really the, 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 the backbone of the historic foundation of the community was the milling along the Credit River, and particularly that of Timothy Street's mill. Um, there are multiple owners to the mill over time, uh, Timothy Street uh, being the founder of the mill, but uh, others including uh, Dracus and Johnson uh, also uh, operated the mill in the Blaines, operated the same mill over time. Um, the, the loss of the mill, September of 1929, uh, the mill was located at the foot of Mill Street um, in Streetsville, um, and the loss of the mill itself was a blow to the economy of the community and really the end of an era, the ending of the milling within the, the, within the confines of the village proper. And the fire is, is a, kind of a sad, stark reminder, kind of this loss of the building, despite the best efforts to, to, to fight the fire. Uh, they just could not. There, was, uh, there were 50,000 bushels of grain in the in the building itself, and that just uh, contributed to the, the spread of the ferocious blaze that consumed the building uh, in September of 1929. Um, hand fireworks uh, uh, explosions in 1942 and 43 uh, on Cotha Road north of Dundas Street was the original location of the Hands Fireworks Company. Um, and um, the uh, January 31st of 1942, the powder room exploded. And this is a uh, hands fireworks in, in uh, 1942 or in the, in the, uh, during the Second World War, um, uh, focused their energies on wartime productions for munitions using their facilities that were uh, generally dedicated for, um, uh, for fireworks. Uh, again, January 31st to 42, the powder room exploded um, and uh, fire consumed the main factory buildings. One employee was killed. His name was, was uh, Jack Dickinson. Uh, July 6th of 1943, um, a second fire on the property in the mixing plant claimed the life of one employee, um, a, a young lady by the name of Norma Krantz. Um, local evacuations were in place um, and uh, a great deal of fear that Companies involved in, in wartime production uh, were, were in danger of espionage. There's no example of that actually being the case here, but there was a worry about it. Um, the factory on Cothra Road finally closed in 1964. Uh, the Texaco Refinery Fire of 1978. October 2nd, 1978, the, um, the Texaco Refinery in Port Credit, uh, a, a, an oil storage, uh, two oil storage tanks, um, uh, north of, uh, of the railway tracks, north of the, the village proper, uh, were cons uh, involved in major fire and uh, local evacuation, a thousand people evacuated, uh, several local explosions. The fire itself burned for two days. It was determined that the, uh, the, the cause was arson and they identified a former employee, uh, Thomas Coxhead, who was arrested, found guilty, and sentenced to 10 years in prison as a result of, uh, he was a disgruntled former employee of, of, the, um, of the refinery. Into our calamities uh, section that affected our community, and this is something that is uh, you know, very uh, compelling to us today and, and considering what we're going through with, uh, with COVID-19. Um, cholera is a, a, uh, an epidemic that came through our community on multiple occasions. Uh, you can just see the dates there. It was kind of a repeat offender, if you will. Uh, early on, there's a 30 to 40% casualty rate for those afflicted. Uh, there are several mass graves and some of our historic cemeteries uh, around Mississauga connecting to this time of, uh, these times of cholera. Um, doctors were really unable to halt the progress. Um, the, the disease itself was highly contagious and not very well understood. Those things kind of sound familiar today as well. We're talking about uh, our current challenges uh, with uh, with coronavirus and the like. Um, we have we have examples in cemeteries where, if you read the dates on cemetery stones, you realize the the mass casualties and even single families wiped out as a result of cholera at different times. Um, other early epidemics that affect our community: diphtheria is probably one of the deadliest. Uh, highly contagious, uh, about 20 to 30% mortality rate, depending on the, on the statistics themselves. 
Uh, we have some uh, families succumbing uh, in, in great number within short periods of time. Um, and again, uh, gravestones in a way are the cheat sheets of history. You can really look at the dates of, of, of family members and start to pick out the kind of the, the early casualties in, in mass, of the, particularly of children. Um, beloved local doctor, after whom Do Dixie wrote his name, Dr. Beaumont Wilson Bowen Dixie, um, sadly lost four of his children uh, in the 1853 uh, diphtheria epidemic. Um, and if you go to St. Peter's uh, Anglican Cemetery, you can find uh, Dr. Dixie's big stone in the foreground and then the four crosses for his four children who lost their lives in diphtheria. Sadly, uh, uh, quite possibly diphtheria that was brought home by their father as he uh, treated the ill in his community to the best of his ability. Absolutely beloved local doctor and that's a story for another time. Um, there were 32 documented cases in 1896 with 18 fatalities. So again, uh, even as the century progressed, still a very deadly disease within our, within our midst. Um, Spanish flu, something we, we may have read more about uh, in, in recent months than we probably, than many of us maybe even thought we ever would or even ever heard of. Um, it's there's an old saying if if you if you don't know your past you're 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 doomed to repeat it um we can we can draw strong parallels between what we're dealing with now in COVID 19 and the spanish flu of 1918 and 1920. um right down to the public notices and this is uh you could you could easily put this notice in a window today and think we're talking about COVID, but here here is uh Dr. McFadden, uh, the medical health officer in Streetsville, issuing um, uh, this, this warning, if you will, uh, to prohibit all gatherings of any public character in churches, schools, public libraries, lodges, moving, picture theater, pool, roo uh, pool rooms, bowling alleys, and any other place of amusement in the municipality of Streetsville until further notice. Um, really gained on trying to control um, the, the deadly spread of the, of the Spanish flu. Um, there was a high mortality rate at the time of the Spanish flu. There was no local hospital. Uh, the Peel Memorial Hospital in Brampton is born out of these times. Uh, there were 600 deaths in Peel County attributed to the flu, although exact numbers are uncertain. Some of the reporting is, is not well known. Uh, about 30,000 uh, Canadians uh, died uh, during the Spanish flu epidemic, so they came in waves. Um, and 25 million died over a worldwide estimated 5% of the global population with a mortality rate around 20%. So this was, the, without a doubt, the deadliest pandemic uh, ever to, to sweep, uh, sweep the planet uh, in modern times and recorded times, that is. Uh, however, um, we are sharing a great deal of similarities with the challenges we currently face with COVID-19. And uh, we'd be well remembered um, to, to think back on the times 100 years ago um, when we were faced by many of the same challenges and uh, how that defined a generation and how they responded to it um, is something well worth, uh, well worth remembering and exploring. Into the, um, uh, the uh, disasters that affected our community now, the, the Ds and the ABCDs. Uh, the 1791 hurricane, that seems like uh, ancient history and it truly, truly is. There, there's very little recorded or well known about the 1791 uh, hurricane other than when it occurred. Um, and uh, it, it was said that the, um, uh, the devastation that was wrought in 1791 was still evident on the ground uh, in the 1806 survey by Samuel Wilmot. Um, and there's a map of Salem and Wilmot you'll see stretching across the, uh, the Credit River Valley there. You'll see the word windfall, and this is denoting the path of, uh, of, of, a, of a major storm that wiped out the, um, uh, the, the forest stands in the, in the lower Credit River Valley. Um, indigenous Mississaugas believed that the water spirit Menudo had departed in anger uh, due to increasing the uh, presence of non-native settlers. However, the, um, the storm itself was, was, was documented um, uh, having struck the shores along Lake Ontario. Um, a lot of damage um, and uh, some of the early notes talk about a landscape that was stripped barren. So we're dealing with a massive storm that has come through in a forested area and wrecked absolute havoc that 
uh, 20 years later when the surveyors are coming through, or sorry, 10 years later when the surveyors are coming through, you still see, they, they still saw a great deal of the devastation that had taken place uh, a few years prior. Uh, the flood of 1879, or 1875, sorry, uh, late spring, uh, um, uh, late long lasting winter compounded by uh, a volcanic eruption that uh, adjusted uh, worldwide temperatures at the time left the solid winter freeze through April and then into um, uh, the end of April, a sudden thaw with tremendous rainfall, swelling the, the, the size of the water and um, uh, some water control, uh, early water control dams and, and mill dams upstream uh, collapsed in time, uh, basically creating a rush of water that came down at high speeds through the Credit River Valley, uh, massive flooding in the lower valley. Uh, Port Credit, the Credit River and Port Credit hit particularly hard. The flooding, the water did not recede for weeks. It was an enormous flood. Um, th this year, in, uh, 1875, was a, a year of a year of uh, famine, um, cool summer, poor crops, uh, poor fishing, absolutely difficult year all around. Largely attributed again to the climate change brought on by the volcanic eruption in Iceland. But the, 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 the flood of 1875, and that's a, a picture that uh, an artist's rendition of a wrecked, school boat call, a wrecked schooner called the Enterprise um, uh, that uh, is, uh, was shown as one of the wrecks as a result of the flood of 1875. The cyclone of 1923, uh, June 24th of 1923, um, referred to as the cyclone, but it really was a tornado. Uh, touched down near Hornby and Halton, not too far out of Milton, and it traveled 20 kilometers in 25 minutes, largely on the ground for its entire time. Uh, damaged many buildings. Um, Cooksville hit particularly hard. Um, the, uh, Cooksville United Church heavily damaged, you can see in the picture there, as was the Cooksville Brickyard building, that's the lower picture there, the Cooksville Brickyard. And three deaths were attributed to people uh, in the Cooksville area being hit by flying debris. Um, and so the cyclone or the tornado of 1923 did tremendous damage along its path. And again, it was on the ground for nearly 25 minutes. Um, what, a, what a horrendous thing to, uh, to have lived through in 1923. The Arendelle Dam burst uh, in 1935. We uh, we think of the Credit River really as kind of a passive recreational river today, but we forget that it is a powerful river that has been used for uh, hydroelectricity uh, electricity generation, uh, for milling purposes and the like. Um, a dam, a, a concrete uh, and earthen dam was, uh, was created uh, across the Credit River Valley to uh, north of Dundas Street to provide a um, uh, head pond for a hydro generation project uh, in the, in the 19 teens. Um, and uh, there was a spring flood uh, higher upstream and it caused a, another dam a little further upstream to fail. And that created a wall of water that rushed down the Credit River Valley, uh, impacting the dam at Arendelle and causing uh, the central section of the dam to, uh, to topple out. And a wall of water from the uh, what was dubbed Lake Arendelle came crashing over, flooding the lower valley and wiping out the Dundas Street Bridge. And you can see in the lower picture there, uh, that is Dundas Street uh, looking eastward up towards uh, up the hill towards uh, to Arendelle Village, but there is no bridge in the foreground. The, uh, the 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 dam burst of '35 wiped out the bridge and the roadway. Uh, the road and bridge uh, were uh, closed for more than eight, mo eight months as the, uh, the entire section was elevated and new bridge installed. Um, and we can see the, the results of that elevation today in, in the way that the, the parkland on either side of, the, of Dundas Street, which is essentially now a causeway um, with a changed elevation, has, uh, has uh, raised the bridge out of uh, direct threat of another flood like that ever occurring. Um, the biggest storm we ever faced uh, uh, to date was undoubtedly Hurricane Hazel in 1954. Uh, the headline of the Toronto Sun of October 14th of 1954 said, there will be rain tonight. Oops, they didn't quite get that one right. Uh, October 15th of 1954, uh, a, um, a hurricane uh, over the Atlantic seaboard uh, coming up the eastern coast of the United States was pulled inland. 
uh, by a low pressure system. It uh, uh, made water go across over the Allegheny Mountains, a weather system, made waterfall again on Lake, Lake Ontario, intensified in its, uh, in its um, uh, ferocity. Uh, and made landfall ground zero at the Humber River and it just moved inland a little bit and then sat there and drenched and drenched and pelted Toronto and Missis historic Mississauga and as far up as, as the Hall and Marsh and it just uh, devastated the communities there and the flooding was enormous. Um, 300 millimeters of rain fell in 48 hours. Um, 81 people killed uh, and a tremendous loss of, of, of personal property. There's an, uh, an aerial shot of some of the after effects of uh, Hurricane Hazel in historic Mississauga along the lakeshore. Um, the dams along the Credit River, again, it made landfall on the Humber River, but with the amount of rain that fell, the rivers like the Credit River and the Tobacco Creek absolutely burst their banks. and. Uh, Alter the landscape of uh, the, of their of their their river course of their systems. Um, the, the Category Four hurricane with uh, highest winds at 155 kilometers an hour. Again, it caused 300 millimeters of rain in 48 hours. Caused massive local flooding. Um, uh, dams were 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 burst. Were uh, overwhelmed. Where the river found a way around the dams. Um, there's a picture below in the Lakeview area of uh, some residents at least having some fun with it. They're fishing off the picnic tables, um, but the, the flooding was was it was intense. Um, and uh, one of the reports at the time said Lakeview in Mississauga, Lakeview was swallowed by the lake between the Topico Creek bursting its banks and the flood coming in, the headwaters coming in from Lake Ontario, absolutely inundated the. Um, uh, the historic shoreline of, 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 of Mississauga. Uh, conservation and flood water uh, measures adopted as a result, including the Credit Valley Conservation Authority, is, uh, is born out of moments like these. Uh, the Meadowvale tornado of 1985, uh, an F1 tornado hit the Meadowvale area of Mississauga, causing over $800,000 of damage. Uh, significant local flooding and service disruption. Um, the, uh, there are two houses destroyed and a historic house known as the Foster House, uh, sorry, the, the Forster House, uh, which is now home to Heritage House Dental. Um, its roof was torn off as a result of the, uh, the tornado and it's replaced. You can see that line within the brick today if you visit uh, Heritage House Dental, the former For uh, uh, Forster House, and you can see where the, the roof has been repaired. Uh, a, a scar or a remembrance, if you will, from the 1985 Meadowvale tornado. And that's the end of our presentation for today. There's lots more to talk about on this, but this is just a, a kind of a tidbit or a, a look at a different type of, 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 uh, of history within our community and uh, ways in which we can explore in, uh, in different ways the fascinating place and the fascinating story that is part of the city of Mississauga today. So. Thank you so much. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga, and we look forward to sharing even more programs with you as we uh, as we go. And uh, be well, and share your stories of um, of coping, of uh, living through these times of COVID nineteen and the coronavirus, and uh, and uh, uh, the closures that we're uh, getting used to. Um, please share your stories with us and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Take care.